It's amazing, it's hopeless They must have never met my God So may say it's over But it was finished on the cross So may say it's broken But the healer's in the room So may say it's hopeless But I know God's about to God's about to
Westside, thanks for your patience as we have had to endure such creativity while navigating COVID-19. While doing our part corporately, not just for ourselves, but for our city and bringing an end to this pandemic. We've all had to learn new ways, lineups, mute buttons. But the worst part is doing life in so many spaces alone. None of us imagined the length nor the fatigue that we'd have to face. And of course, the changing news that continued to force us with starts and stops. Our church with history and amazing leaders now facing strange direction that it seems that this script would be difficult for us indeed. Yet our partnership, when we think of our friends in Italy, started their church and immediately were stopped. No history, no backdrop. And suddenly they were stopped because of pandemic protocol. And that time, at that time, the largest outbreak of COVID-19. But the church grew and it thrived and so did we. Boats, wells and storms. Jesus, send them home. We can't feed them. These moments are overwhelming to us. Sometimes we often felt over the last year like we're up a tree. We're an onlooker like Zacchaeus. We're an outsider. But Jesus invites himself into our situation and we are changed. We grow and we move forward again. As a leadership team, we chose to imagine a product, something we could produce that could be used while we were outside of building that could be imagined, filled with faith of Jesus impacting other people's lives. Our online presence has not only served each of you in staying connected, but a new faithful tool to share with others. And now it has grown beyond us. This is the message of Jesus. And this was always the Jesus way, everywhere he went, inviting others to follow and to see life different with such hope under any circumstance. As we look to reopen, we will be continuing to grow our online presence for you at any time you're able to be with us. With just the simple click of a button, you can be with us on any given weekend. This is also the way that we share the gospel within social connections, family and communities. So it's exciting to say that on Father's Day, Sunday, June 20th, we will have the doors open to invite you back inside together again. We will be in phase two of Alberta's plans, which allows one third capacity, but registration is required. And it will open on Monday, June 14th at nine o'clock. So please make sure that you register at wkc.org slash reopening. Thanks for your patience as we continue to navigate this new way forward. Let's continue to pray that this pandemic is behind us and that our new normal will include more people than ever before who have found faith when it was needed the most. Let's continue to be open to the many challenges that the past year has had on so many of us, but let's continue to see the hand of God continue to lead his people. I know that it feels like a road trip with the kids kicking at the back of your seat. Are we there yet? And the answer is, West Side, it's yes. So things are reopening in Alberta, including the church, which is exciting for like many of us for all sorts of different reasons, but it has been a long journey of isolation, of, of being on our own, of not being together as a community. I am looking forward to seeing so many of you back in person again. For the last 14, 15 months, it's just been Will and I in a room uh, together uh, <laughs> making these sermons. So I've had, a, I've had a congregation of one for the last little while, and at very least I think Will is looking forward to having somebody else here uh, rather than just me. As we're coming towards reopening, I find myself reflecting on a situation that I had when I was in my early 20s. I, I'd spent a bit of time in the US in a church context over there and had returned back to the UK. And I was driving home on the second or third day that I was back in the UK. 
Uh, and I started to approach a traffic circle. Um, we, we call them roundabouts, and we have a lot of them in the UK. And now for context, as many of you will be aware, we drive on different sides of the road in the UK than we do in North America. In the UK, uh, we drive on the left-hand side of the road, and our steering wheel is on the right-hand side of the car. Whereas in North America, you drive on the right-hand side of the road, and your steering wheel is on the wrong side of the car. Um, or at least that's how we, we like to think about it. Now, this, of course, means that we also do traffic circles in a completely different way as well. And so this road that I had driven on hundreds and hundreds of times in my, in my life already, I approached it, and because I was back home, I wasn't really paying attention to my directions. Uh, I wasn't really paying attention to my driving, to be totally honest. I'd had months in the U.S. where I had to constantly remember to drive correctly, but now I was back to my familiar space. I was back to my norm, and I approached this this roundabout just outside of my home and went round it the completely wrong way and uh, managed to avoid uh, death by <laughs> fortunately there not being anyone else on the roundabout at the time. And I found myself totally thrown by this. Like, how was this possible that I could spend all this time in the States and never get this wrong once? And then a matter of meters from my own house, do things wrong. Something had changed in my months away. The that which was unfamiliar to me initially in, in the U.S. had actually become familiar to me. Uh, perhaps we can say it like this, and you can see why this story came back to my mind. The unprecedented had now become the normal. And th what happens then when the unprecedented becomes the normal, the normal doesn't feel normal anymore. Which makes me kind of want to ask, is returning from isolation just the flick of a switch? Or are we gonna have to learn how to be together again? At work, in our social lives, at church. Like as we come out of the trenches of our social media worlds and start to rejoin one another in person again, I wanna jump into a short series that I'm simply gonna call Share. We've, we've spent nearly one and a half years now where much of our only sharing, assuming we were following the rules, was that button on social media. And now we're going to have to share space again, share company again with each other. And I want to talk about that today in, in four just really simple moves as we each kind of journey back into being together again. I want to talk about your brain around others. I want to talk about how rage is not a fruit of the Spirit. I want to ask the question, did Jesus really mean him? And I want to think about the word koinonia. So let's begin here. We know that our brains are complex. We carry them around everywhere with us, but probably understand them pretty much least of everything we own. Like. Our brains are there, we live with them, we have them, but, but actually, how well do we understand how we think and what we do? And what's interesting is much of our brain is dedicated to and shaped by our interactions with others. Our brains are processing what's going on all the time with how we are around other people and how other people are impacting on us. So one of the things we know about our brains is they tell us that for us as humans, a huge amount of our brain power is given to how we relate and interact with each other. So you might say, our brains suggest we're designed to be dependent upon each other if so much of our resource is used to interact. But here's the problem. We haven't seen much of each other recently. Now, why is that a problem? Well, this has led many of us to think that maybe, just maybe, we're fine without everybody else. And, and there's a lot of the times, I think, within our own psychology that we try to believe that. It's quite common to hear people say, well, I just don't care what other people think. Like, we tell ourselves this quite regularly. And, you know, maybe that's why there's been so many of those kind of Facebook posts over the last year, where people are now deciding that they are just going to post online what they really think. And, and what I want to just sort of hold in your minds and thoughts just at this moment is that we're all just a little socially rusty. And like, that would be okay. 
Like that would be fine, except that there, we've also been dealing with a pandemic. So we've been away from each other and dealing with something which, to be honest with you, unless you're about 100, you've got no experience of dealing with before. You've not lived through a global pandemic before. So there's been like a whole host of learning and changing happening while we've been at home. And many of us have gone in different directions on many of the things that have happened while we were indoors. Like think about, just think a little bit about what's happened in the last year and a half. We've had initial attitudes towards the pandemic that have continued throughout the whole time about what do we feel about this pandemic and what do we think about it? Uh, questions about masks, do you wear them, do you not wear them? Race riots that have happened throughout this whole story and then vaccines and what we do about them. And we don't always know what each other think about this. But what we have learned, we've seen it online, we've seen it in our media, that if you happen to come down on the wrong side of any one of these issues, then you risk suffering the wrath of the people on the other side. Like our context right now of where we are creates almost a perfect storm of issues for our brains. Uh, Dean Burnett explains it like this. He says, fear of social judgment causes anxiety. Provocation triggers the anger system and seeking approval can be a powerful motivator for us. And, and now think about those three things. So we live in this perfect storm of anxiety, anger, and approval seeking. Like if we live in that, because we've got anxiety about some things, different people are not anxious about the same things as us, so then we found anger about that, but we don't like being angry with people because actually what we like is approval from people. You start to think about that churning around, like that gets exhausting and it starts to change us. Let me, let me explain it as an example like this. Like I've, I've been wearing a mask from pretty early on in the pandemic. Um, they're uncomfortable. And just to be really honest, they're not great for my beard, right? I know that fashion should be our least uh, concern uh, at a time like this. And you're also willing to talk back to the TV at a moment, moment like this and say, I'm not sure that beard is fashion, right? But, but the evidence of masks seems to show that they, they do seem to reduce the chances of me spreading coronavirus. So I made a decision kind of early on and that even though it's not kind of clear whether the mask will help me personally, it does seem like it's going to help the people around me. So I decided to wear one. Here's what struck me as interesting. Last summer, I noticed how angry I was becoming when I found myself in the company of other people that weren't wearing masks. So if I was in a store somewhere or in some sort of other context, and I just think about that for a second. So I've made a decision to do something because my motivation would be I, I want to care about others. But yeah, I'm becoming angry at those very people that I'm supposedly wearing the mask to protect because I don't think they're doing it right in the same way as I want to be treated. And that's kind of complex if you think about it, that I can become very angry at the people that I'm supposedly motivated to be kind to. And like there's been a lot that could make me angry over this past year because I have my own personal opinions about where we should land on many of the complex subjects that have come up during the pandemic. And, and you do too. And yet maybe I was angry at the stuff that you think differently from me. Uh, you know, you may have seen me in the store and been angry at me for wearing a mask because, hey, look at that pastor, he's just a sheep, right? Or maybe I've been angry at you because you were doing something that I disagreed with. Maybe we disagree on racial reconciliation. Maybe we disagree on vaccines. Maybe we disagree on something else. But here's what I wanna say, either way, where you stand on one issue or the next issue, I think there's something we need to confess together, that anger isn't a fruit of the Spirit. Like, I, I want to be a voice for justice. I want to be a voice against injustice. 
but I really don't want to be a voice for outrage. I don't want to disguise my anger behind the gospel. I don't want to pretend that I really, you know, I'm, I'm into this thing, but actually it's just becoming a vent for my anger. You and me might disagree on something, but if I'm angry about it, then we're, we're not going to find togetherness. We're not going to find unity. And see, the idea isn't always for us all to agree. The idea, from, in my reading of the text of Scripture, is that we learn to live together. And why that's difficult, I think, is for many of us, our anger is pretty near the surface right now. It's been a tough time. And when things are tough, anger tends to float to the top. And we're all about to start hanging out again soon. <laughs> like, this could get spicy. And that's why I want to talk about it. The church isn't going to be exempt from any of this. Next week, many of us are going to be back in the same room. And my question is this. How are we going to treat each other? Like there's a tendency as humans to, well, there's a tendency as humans to categorize people into either friend or enemy category, right? And, and who we like and who we don't like and who's with us and who's against us. It just seems to be that we like dividing people up into that category. What's interesting is Jesus comes along, and it's almost as if Jesus gets that that's what we do. He gets that we go friend, enemy, in or out, with us or against us. And he, and he comes in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, verse 44. Jesus doesn't say, stop having enemies, <laughs> as bluntly as that. Instead, what he says is, love your enemy. Whoa, well, wait a minute. So what Jesus is saying is that prior to agreeing on something, prior to finding the middle ground on something, we must find a way to love each other first. So don't make your enemy your friend and then love them, but actually love them first. That's what we're called to do. So what about that person that doesn't seem to be taking the pandemic as seriously as me? Yes, you love them. Or what about that person that seems to be panicking too much about the pandemic and blowing it out of proportion? Yeah, love that person. I, I love how Sky Jatani puts it. He says, he says this, he says, a narcissist loves only himself. A nationalist loves only his tribe. An activist loves only his cause. An idealist loves only his thoughts. A humanist loves only his concept of humanity. A Christian, a Christian loves the irritating person right in front of him. Or rather, we should. So, so we're all coming back to the same spaces. And I think it's a good time to remind ourselves that the goal of the church, as I've said already, is not that we all agree. It's not uniformity. Jesus doesn't want us to all be the same. Rather, he wants us to live out the call to love one another. Yep, even that irritating person right in front of you right now. <laughs> And I know that's difficult. I know that I'm not asking you to do something easy. And David Foster Wallace famously wrote it like this. He said, is it possible really to love other people? Like, isn't a big part of love caring more about what the other person needs? How am I supposed to subordinate my own overwhelming need to somebody else's needs that I can't even feel directly? And yet, if I can't do this, I'm damned to loneliness, which I definitely don't want. So I'm back at trying to overcome my selfishness for self-interested reasons. Like, is there any way out of this bind? When the early Christians were establishing churches across the ancient Mediterranean, you see them constantly committed to each other via the language of koinonia. Now, koinonia was a Greek word, which is what they spoke back then, so that kind of makes sense. But it was a Greek word that spoke to the notions of unity and equality. Koinonia, often in your, in your New Testament, often koinonia is the Greek word that's behind the word fellowship when you see it there. Now, 
I grew up in a church context where fellowship meant cookies and tea after a church service. It meant let's all get together and eat something. But fellowship in the terms of koinonia is much, much deeper than that. It's about being called into the way of Jesus. For them, the word sort of summed up this call from Jesus to love one another, to act in a way that benefits the other, that stands alongside the other, that respects the journey that the other is on. Paul expresses this notion in Romans chapter 12, verse 15 and 16. And I think about this, this is what Paul says. He says, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Now, let me just read that again for you, just for a second. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. And our eyes are kind of naturally drawn to live in harmony with one another. But I love what he says in verse 15 about you rejoice with the rejoicing and you weep with the weeping. Like, let me say it like this. Paul imagines a community where, where we kind of roll with each other. We navigate our relationships where we allow the location, the, the position, the feelings, and the emotions of others to shape how we behave. So it's not now, how do I feel? Well, I'm going to govern and shape how I feel based on what I'm experiencing around these people that I have committed to care for, that I have koinonia with, that I want to have fellowship with. So take stock of where you are right now and then where others are right now. And have a think about that. Where am I? Where are they? Now, a word we used a while back, a word that got overused, in fact, a word that you're probably happy not to have heard for a little while. The word was unprecedented. Like we used that word a lot at the start of the pandemic, right? The pandemic was unprecedented for us. But let me just say this. It's also unprecedented for our generations to know how to get out of a pandemic. If it was unprecedented a year and a half ago to watch a pandemic start, for those of us in Alberta, if it was unprecedented for 15 months ago for a pandemic to start, then this is what we know. It's unprecedented to leave a pandemic. It's unprecedented to step out of this. We've never gone into a pandemic before. We've never got out of one before. And so we don't know the map. We don't know how aspects of this work just yet. And so we may be approaching the end of some aspects of the pandemic, isolation, distancing, restrictions, but we're not approaching the end of its impact. And regardless of whether you agree with that or not, we're tired. Like we're tired. It's been tiring whether it's been tiring through because of your work restrictions, your family challenges, your financial impact, your mental health in it all, your relationships, people are tired, whether we acknowledge it or not. So we're going to come back together and some people are going to be joyful, like they're back outside and they're feeling good, right? And, and they're going to be excited and enthusiastic and that may get the better of them and they may want to just kind of let rip and just step away from all restrictions and just be back out because that's the way it is. But there's going to be other people for whom this might be a little too much, that actually it's a bit of a slower journey coming back to hang out together. And for some people, that might be a tough journey. Like I have, I have this online connection who's a pastor. And I noticed just kind of in the back of my mind that I'd not seen him online for a few days. And then I, I noticed some Twitter movements happening this morning and discovered that today he took his own life. And I've watched this, this guy navigate his way through one of the difficult periods of world history. And then today... He took his own life. Like we are constantly encountering people for whom the things that hardly bother you are burdens for them. And what might not bother them is a burden for you. But it's difficult to know how to navigate our way forward when we're all so different. And for one person, 
it might just be too much. And the same thing for you might be great joy. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. That's how we share life together. In another of Paul's letters, Galatians, he writes this, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Like carry the load together. If you're joyful and someone else weeps, carry that weeping with them. There's a sense that we come together and we carry it together. We, you know, there is many hands carry the one load. And I think this is innovative community work from the early Christians because what they're saying is, you matter to me. Your concerns are important to me. That's how we live out the Jesus way, the law of Christ, as Paul talks about it. The Jesus-shaped community puts each other first. And that's not natural. Like one of the languages we've encountered a lot throughout the pandemic has been this oppression of our personal freedoms. We're just used to putting our personal freedoms above everything. But the early church, the church of Jesus, saw its goal as to put others first. So let me unwisely then wade into some slightly controversial space. masks, (laughs) masks, <laughs> vaccines, six feet distancing. Like they can be a source of disagreement for us. We can all fight about that if we want. Social media has taught me that over the last few months. And we can choose to argue and decide who's right and who's wrong and what's the best way to go forward. Or we can see a way of dealing with it as a mark of respect. Maybe you disagree with the person getting a vaccine. Maybe you disagree with the person wearing a mask. Or maybe you disagree with the people the other way around. What if we actually figure out a way to live where we just say, I'm prepared to sacrifice some of my freedom because you matter to me. And not just in our church buildings, but in how we behave throughout our lives as we step forward, as we move forward into the future into what life after restrictions looks like. The brilliant writer Flannery O'Connor offers this. She says, I think that the church is the only thing that is going to make the terrible world we are coming to endurable. The only thing that makes the church endurable is that it's somehow the body of Christ and that on this we are fed. Like it seems to be a fact that you have to suffer as much from the church as for it. But if you believe in the divinity of Christ, you have to cherish the world at the same time that you struggle to endure it. And I love that thought that we're in this together and we, and we struggle together to make things right, to make things different. So have patience with each other. Let's love one another, even that irritating person in front of you. Let's figure out how to bear one another's burdens. Let's respect one another. Let's have this attitude, whether it's our our workplace or whether in our church space, to say, you matter to me, even if we don't necessarily see eye to eye on everything. So as we return to something that hopefully appears normal. May we learn to share our space well. May we look for Christ in ourselves so that we can see him in others too. And may we bear each other's burdens, worries, fears, and insecurities together in a Christ-like way. And may we I say this with some excitement, perhaps in person. See you next week. Grace and peace. I could rest you in your arms forever Cause I know nobody loves me better Hold on to me Hold on.